Andrew Watson began to notice the climate and biodiversity emergencies after a special IPCC report in 2018, warning that we had only 12 years to save the planet. Shocked by the lack of any substantive response from political leaders and the media, he was moved to become a speaker, writer and campaigner. He now works to raise public awareness and to push for positive solutions with talks to businesses, charities, schools, local government authorities and community groups. Thank you for the invitation to talk today. I am, as perhaps I hope this photo now shows, speaking to you from Scotland in the UK, where I'm lucky enough to live. Obviously, it's a subjective judgment to say that Scotland is one of the world's most beautiful countries, though, of course, it is. And that's in large part why I'm so passionate about safeguarding our environment. It is, though, an objective fact to say that we're also one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Here in the UK, we're essentially a founder member of the Global North. And I'll be using that term today, Global North, alongside Global South, not with reference to geographical location, but to reflect global power relations based on political, cultural, and economic inequalities. So when I say that the global North bears overwhelming responsibility for the climate crisis, I have to recognize my own role in that. It's a role that we in the UK like to overlook. We like to refer to the fact that we're only responsible for about 1% of global emissions, while we look at countries like China that puffs out over 30% of emissions. We like graphs like this, where our emissions are so low, they don't even feature. But this is a convenient way to overlook the fact that by population, a country like China is 20 times the size of the UK. Per capita emissions look more like this. Then there's the point that the main greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, hangs around in the atmosphere for about a thousand years, which means that the CO2 spewed out by the very first British engines more than two centuries ago is still heating the planet today. Factor in that cumulative effect per capita, and it's clear that if we in the global north have managed to reduce our emissions to the point that we're only about 1%, that's thanks to the wealth that we've gained in no small part from so many decades of polluting the planet. According to one recent study, over the last 150 years, the global north, and that includes Australia and New Zealand, have been responsible for 92% of excess emissions, with only the remaining 8% coming from the global south. But while the global north has caused the problem, it's the global south that suffers the most. This map shows the 10 countries most affected by the impacts of weather-related events in 2019, with reference to fatalities and economic loss. As you can see, Mozambique was top of the list after being hit by cyclone after cyclone. The estimated financial loss was 3.2 billion US dollars. As a country, though, they're responsible for 0.02% of global CO2 emissions. Most of the 5 million climate-related deaths every year are in the global south. Climate change disproportionately affects people of colour who make up the majority of the world's population, are least to blame, and are predominantly based in the global south. They're also the most vulnerable already. So why is that? Let's look at that. From the 15th century onwards, the UK and other European countries developed the model of a global extractive economy. And they justified their plunder with myths of a racial hierarchy and the belief that Christianity, commerce, and civilization should be welcomed by all. Take India. From 1765 to the 1930s, Britain drained India of the equivalent of an estimated 45 trillion US dollars. Some argue that the industrialization of Britain relied on the de-industrialization of India, as their raw materials were brought back to be exported around the world for our profit. Or take Africa, where an estimated 13 million people were stolen for profit. 
At the Berlin Conference of 1885 to 1886, European powers divided Africa between themselves, a process that left Britain ruling 30% of the continent's population and allowed for the theft of minerals, food, and raw materials. And the new agricultural processes we imposed eradicated indigenous practices by deforesting land in favor of cash crops. In the Congo, it was rubber. In India, it was cotton. In the Caribbean, it was sugar plantations and livestock. And of course, the infrastructure necessary to consolidate and maximize this exploitation relied on a growing fossil fuel economy. The global north grew wealthy at the expense of the global south, and in colonialism, sowed the seeds of climate change. Some argue that these are historic wrongs, that we can't be held responsible for the sins of our fathers. And that would be a stronger case if those same people weren't still enjoying the fruits of those past emissions, and if they weren't continuing to benefit from similar exploitation today, because colonialism, with its supremacy of profit over people, continues alive and well. Only today, it's not nations, but multinationals. Raw materials continue to be extracted from the global south for profits and benefits that are realized largely in the global north. We could look at the mass deforestation and human rights violations across the global south in pursuit of palm oil for our ice creams, our detergents, our shampoos, and our chocolates. And the links to Mars, Nestle, and PepsiCo, and Unilever, actually a direct descendant of British interests in Nigeria. And while we're in Nigeria, we could look at Shell, granted exclusive oil rights there by the British colonial government in 1938. Their oil spills in the Niger Delta have devastated traditional fishing and farming. And as Shell is now planning to pull out of the area, they're using expensive lawyers to argue against cleaning up behind them. This is Shell who declared profits last year of almost 40 billion US dollars. Shell in which many of us perhaps invest, if not at the pump, then in our pensions. We could look at the soya trade linked to the mass deforestation of the Amazon and the genocide of indigenous communities in Brazil so that we can feed the animals that make up our meat-heavy diets. Or we could talk about the hundreds of thousands of tons of fresh fish caught off the coast of Senegal and Mauritania by industrial fleets from China, Turkey, Russia and Europe. Those fish aren't used to feed local starving populations, but are exported to feed our farmed salmon and trout, leaving behind devastated economies. Fossil fuels, palm oil, diamonds, grain, soya, fish, lithium and cobalt for our electric vehicles, the list goes on. But it's not all about extraction. I mentioned electric vehicles. With the ever tightening emissions regulations in the global north, we are discarding our old petrol and diesel cars. 80 to 90% of cars imported to Kenya, Ethiopia, and Nigeria are used cars. 40% of the world's used cars are dumped on Africa, compared to only 2% of new vehicles, with obvious implications for their emissions, their road safety, and their air pollution. There's also plastic. We here in the UK, we are the world's second largest producer of plastic waste per person. Much of it is exported to the global south, where, lacking the facilities for even any claim to recycling, it ends up contaminating the local groundwater, the air and the soil. It's estimated that between 400,000 and 1 million people die every year in the global south because of diseases related to waste and plastic pollution. That's one person every 30 seconds, so that we can enjoy our cheese sandwiches. Exploitation, extraction and pollution through the exertion of economic and political leverage. In fact, it's been estimated that since just 1960, richer countries have drained a total of 62 trillion US dollars from the global south, leading to loss growth of 152 trillion. 
All too often, the global south lacks the political and economic strength to mount effective opposition. Politically marginalized groups have few means of protection against extractivist projects that violate their rights or interests when confronted with the militarized states and corporate actors that are a mainstay of the extractivism economy. And through multiple global systems, which governments, finance, the media, or otherwise, these inequalities become self-reinforcing. I want to look today at just two areas in which this is stark, in the world of climate science itself and in the world of finance. So even within the climate world and the agenda setting IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this imbalance perpetuates. Firstly, the predominant language, like today, is overwhelmingly English. And as an IPCC scientist, you don't get paid for your work, which places obvious constraints on those less able to fund themselves or who can't be supported by their home country. Participation demands a level of wealth. Access to research databases and the necessary computing infrastructure is far harder for those from the Global South. And the path to publication also favours the wealthy. The world-renowned journal Nature currently charges 11,690 US dollars for open access publication. That's the equivalent of the net annual earnings of scientists in many African institutions. Then, if published, Global South research faces consistent bias in the media. Of the 100 most cited climate change research papers over the last five years, almost three quarters were affiliated with institutions in North America, Europe, or Australia. Less than 1% were from the African continent. The IPCC has taken steps to combat a lack of diversity, but still the global South is home to 84% of the world's population, but only 31% of IPCC contributions. And when it's recognized that the IPCC doesn't produce its own models, but simply reviews existing published literature, it's no surprise that mitigation paths are based upon and so further embed huge inequalities. The global financial systems also perpetuate the imbalance. For a start, so many countries in the global south are already in debt. The world's poorest, they, the world's poorest countries, they spend five times more on debt payments than on the infrastructure needed to deal with the environmental emergency. And these countries lack the funds themselves. After Hurricane Sandy hit the US, the House of Representatives was able to approve an aid package of 50 billion US dollars. That is 12 times more than the total climate mitigation spend that same year of the world's 34 poorest countries combined. And they lack the international aid. I mentioned the cyclones that hit Mozambique in 2019. The country issued an appeal, and by the end of that year, only 47% of the necessary funding was covered, leaving the already indebted state to raise the balance on its own. Looking at Africa as a whole, the continent represents 17% of the global population, 90% of whom are without access to basic energy. But Africa accounts for a mere 2% of global clean energy finance. And they also lack access to borrowing. There's a global south premium when it comes to seeking finance, risk perception, the difficulty of paying back US dollar loans in depreciating local currencies, and the expectation of delivering conventional rates of return whilst raising revenue from customers often earning less than $1 a day, all make borrowing harder. Risk to capital is prioritized over risk to life. The Global South wants and needs to mitigate and adapt. But our global economic and political systems starve them of the power and resources to do so. Going back to carbon emissions and looking at it per capita across regions highlights the injustice at the heart of the climate crisis. Now, for what it's worth, Australia, according to our world in data in 2021, sat at a little over 15 tonnes per capita. So clearly on the far right of this particular graph. <laughs> 
And bear in mind, this is a snapshot only. It shows only current emissions, conveniently overlooks the vast historic emissions of the global north. So to remain within 1.5 degrees of warming, the world needs to converge within this dotted band that you can see there by 2030. That allows the global south a budget not just to raise themselves to a decent standard of living, but also to adapt to a problem imposed upon them by the global north. They need this budget to build infrastructure of steel and concrete to withstand extreme weather, to mitigate against hotter weather with air conditioning and cold storage for food and medicines, to prepare for a drier climate with pumped irrigation, desalination, fertilizers, all in incredibly energy intensive. This slim budget for them is a matter of life or death. They have no choice. Whereas we in the global north so often do. Our high emissions are the result of lifestyles we've come to think of as reasonable, but are so often a matter of choice. Choosing to fly off on another holiday, choosing to drive an SUV, choosing to invest our pensions in the fossil fuel industry. And all too often, we make these choices when there's a viable and sustainable alternative. So if this graph here highlights the problem, it also points to the solution. The only way this world will stay within a safe level of warming is for the global north to drastically reduce their own emissions and resource use, while at the same time championing regulation and reform to empower the global south. Let's briefly look at just how drastic the emissions reductions of the world's wealthiest have to be. And I'm not just talking here about the ultra rich with their mansions, their super yachts and their private jets. An income of 38,000 US dollars, that's what, about 57,000 Australian dollars, puts you within the world's richest 10%. And $109,000 US dollars, that's that 163 Australian dollars, puts you in the top 1%. Here you can see the clear link between emissions and income. So the yellow bars are the wealthiest 10% in each region, responsible between 1990 and 2015 for over half of global emissions. If this graph actually showed the wealthiest 1%, those around the world earning above 109,000 US dollars, they would be off the chart. In fact, if the wealthiest 1% reduce their emissions by just 30%, that alone would meet our global targets for 2030. I'm going to show you our path to net zero here in the UK. And this is being generous to the wealthiest amongst us because it's taking national averages. Obviously, those with the greatest income are likely to have the greatest emissions. So their reductions will have to be even more dramatic. But here it is. From an average of 8.5 tonnes down to 2.5 by 2030. So that's just seven years now. Then we have another 10 years to get it down to 1.4, and then another 10 years to half it again to 0.7. This is what the science tells us we need to achieve to give ourselves even a chance of remaining within a 1.5 degree world. And just to put those figures into some perspective, here are the emissions of one return economy flight from London to Alicante in the Mediterranean, the sort of trip that many in the UK would think nothing of. And here's one return economy flight from London to New York. This then is the challenge of emissions cuts and lifestyle changes needed by just the average resident of the United Kingdom, let alone the top 10% or even 1%. Meanwhile, alongside our own emissions cuts, as I've said, we need to empower the disempowered. That means we need to accept the principle of polluter pays. We need to meet and expand our loss and damage commitments. By 2020, annual payments were due to have risen to 100 billion US dollars. In 2019, actual payments were still under 80 million billion, excuse me. We also need to cancel debt. We need to reform international institutions and policies to embed equality and give those most impacted 
a greater voice. We need to enforce land rights. Indigenous communities are intricately linked to the land and ecosystems, which they've been sustainably managing for generations. We need to leave land in their care rather than at the mercy of industrial agriculture. We need to share green tech and expertise patent free. And we need to recognize the insights of those on the front line, their knowledge and experience, their ability to see the connections between the systems that decide and define how we live. Those closest to the problem are often closest to the solutions. And for obvious reasons, they have a determination and a resolve to act often missing in the global north. Perhaps then in framing the solution, in terms of the global north giving up power and reducing consumption, we can understand why after so many decades, climate action still so often seems so insubstantial. How many nations, after all, are willing to give up power? How many companies are willing to reduce their profits? And how many individuals are willing to renounce the conveniences and luxuries of their privileged, high-emitting lifestyles? We are hurtling towards a warmer world, with consequences that are increasingly impacting every one of us, including those who might have previously considered themselves sheltered by their relative wealth. And this is all on a global average of around 1.2 degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. As you all know, the goal set by the IPCC is to keep warming to 1.5 degrees of warming, or at least two. The consequences of going beyond that are terrifying. And if every country in the world was to meet its net zero pledges, we could end up at around 1.7 degrees of warming. Unfortunately, though, emissions continue to rise and we just don't have the policies in place to make those pledges a reality. Under current policies, we're looking at nearer 2.6 degrees of warming and potentially up to almost four degrees. As the UN Environment Programme put it, every fraction of a degree matters. Incremental change is no longer an option. Only a wide-ranging, large-scale, rapid and systemic transformation can avoid climate disaster. You can see here the scale of cuts needed to give us a chance of remaining within 1.5. The later we leave it, the more dramatic the change that science demands. It is without doubt the biggest challenge our species has ever faced and a challenge that demands a response from every one of us, and especially those whose wealth, individual or national, has made them responsible. The good news, though, is that there still remains enough of a carbon budget to provide a good standard of living for everyone. Comfortable, affordable homes, the elimination of fuel poverty, secure and valued employment, high quality public transport leading to safer streets, more urban space for community facilities, less noise pollution, less water pollution, better infrastructure, better air quality, better health, contributing to better education, increased biodiversity, stronger and more equitable communities, energy security and huge savings. A study last year put the financial benefit of transitioning to clean energy at over 12 trillion US dollars. Collectively, that is a future worth fighting for, almost regardless of any benefit to the climate. Our real challenge then is to convince the global north that a fairer world is a better world for everyone. Thank you very much for listening.